So welcome everyone. My name is Shannon Holmes. I'm a medical physicist with Standard Imaging. Um, I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, Vicki Howard, um, also a medical <laughs> physicist. Um, and we're looking at um, TG307, trying to give you a, not way down in the weeds, but an, an overview of what TG307 is really about. Um, because I, I admit, um, even having been part of, of this, uh, this TG, it's got everybody, uh, including myself, thinking um, kind of in a, a renewed interest in the use of epids. So with that, um, we've got a little bit of housekeeping to begin with. Um, we are recording the webinar today. If you have questions, please put them in um, at any time in the go or it's not go to meeting in the Teams app. Um, we will try and get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm I'm not confident yet uh, <laughs> with my webinar skills on Teams um, to be able to to guarantee I can we can monitor that during the presentation uh, but we'll do our best um, enter them at any time we'll try and make sure we get to them uh, at least at the end if not before um, if you're not familiar with standard imaging we are based in Middleton Wisconsin which is just outside the state capital of Madison um, we were founded a little bit over 30 years 35 years ago goodness time flies um, about 35 years ago um, with a very modest selection of products but we have grown quite a bit um, we're still not a huge company but uh, we do now design and manufacture a full suite of qa products for radiation therapy um, so with that i guess let's get into what is tg307 um, TG307 really is guidance uh, for using your portal imager for IMRT and VMAT dosimetry, not just pretreatment QA, but also looking at the during treatment um, or transit dosimetry. So 307 does a really good job of discussing some of the strengths and limitations of commercial EPIDs, um, of commercial EPID dosimetry software, and then provides some recommendations for commissioning, for validation, um, and performing routine QA. Yeah, I'm really excited about this presentation too, um, and thrilled that there's, it's a timely release of TG307. It's really great to see task groups being proactive with emerging technology so that, you know, our customers and, and physicists can try to stay ahead of the curve to really ensure their quality assurance program continues to meet like, all the new demands and risks associated with the, the advancements we continue to see in our field. TG307 really is a valuable resource for physicists who want to take their patient-specific QA to another level or a step further to really ensure that we effectively manage dosimetric risks throughout the treatment process, not just pre-treatment QA. So I'm excited about our talk. Oh, yeah, definitely. Do you, um, do you want to talk a little bit about why the EPID is such an exciting tool to be able to use for dosimetry, why it's getting this interest right now? Yes, definitely. Um, first, you already have the hardware, so why not use it to its full potential? Really modern EPIDs offer several advantages over traditional QA devices and the EPID technology of the past that you know some of you might be familiar with. There's many improvements above that now. So EPIDs have superior resolution and efficiency, they're high image quality and much improved dosimetric characteristics. And then lastly, EPIDs are really easy to use and integrate into basically any clinic's workflow for, for seamless dosimetry applications from pretreatment QA, like I mentioned, and, and through to in vivo QA. So you can just, it, it's just easy to incorporate. It's important to remember that, you know, while we can create highly conformal treatment plans based on a patient CT scan, and these plans can pass traditional QA uh, with flying colors, really the true measure of quality of care in radiation oncology is how well the dose is delivered to the patient and not to a phantom or a detector array. So really, I think that's why TG307 exists is because it's recognized that including the patient in our dosimetry QA practices is increasingly important. And EPID dosimetry enables this from, its, it offers an end-to-end -end QA solution. And, yeah, it and I know, oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I know in Europe, there are definitely countries now that are, are starting to require some in vivo dosimetry to ensure that you really are delivering those those doses um, as you planned to deliver them. Um, and yeah. so the, the EPID is getting definitely quite a bit of interest over there as well, not just with AAPM. Yeah, uh, very much integrated as a risk management tool as we are delivering higher doses, more conformal, shorter timeframes. We need to keep an, an eye and our finger on the pulse of what dosimetrically is happening with the patient on a day to day basis. So, yeah. That's good. Um, I just realized, uh, Vicki, our screen says that we're off screen. Um, Ashley, can you maybe confirm, or or if somebody wants to enter into the questions, if you can actually see our cameras? Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was part of using this system is be able to share that. So we'll we'll continue, but but please let us know on that one. Um, so I I was actually going to comment um, in kind of involved with your your mentioned earlier about the epids have improved. I think that's part of the reason that this that. Um, that this wasn't used previously is because the the epids weren't necessarily as stable. They weren't giving you this the the um, consistent response every time, or they were more uh, they would degrade more with dose, or or it was just a different system that had more energy dependence, or you know stuff like that where it worked fine for imaging for your your uh, um, your your setup pictures, but it didn't necessarily work as we needed it to in order to get the dose dose symmetry. Definitely. Um, so I guess my next slide here is about strengths and weaknesses of the EPID. Um, I've got the strengths from, uh, I guess we, we discussed that in the prior slide with image resolution, with the fact that it's integrated with the system that you have right now. Um, but there are a number of weaknesses of the EPID too that have been um, concerns. And, and again, part of that delay in getting this system into the dosimetry world and not just the imaging world. Um, I've got the schematic from TG307 here on the right of kind of the, the general layers that are included in a, a modern EPID where you have this um, copper buildup um, in order to create the electrons to create the, the um, uh, light in the phosphor screen that would then be detected by this photodiode array. Um, and the fact that there are these, these higher, uh, heavier materials in your portal imager um, gives it a bit of an energy dependence. Um, it, it also gives it some off axis dependencies just because of the, the changing spectrum, particularly in higher energies, um, that gives it a field size dependence. So these sorts of things have to be corrected for um, after the fact. Um, you get backscatter sometimes from uh, variant imagers in particular for a while um, had a very heavy arm that held up the imager and you could see the arm in the back uh, due, due to the backscatter from it um, in the images. I think that's a little better now with some of them, the, the updated systems, but it is still something that needs to be considered um, or be corrected for. Um, and then there's the, the effort is nice because it's always perpendicular to the head of your machine but it, it can sag. There, there is some mechanical play there um, and that may need to be corrected for as well at, at particular angles um, or, or the, the field looks like it shifted just because the EPID is not in the, the proper place. Um, there are some field size limitations just geometrically because of the size of the imager. Um, but when you start looking at transit dosimetry and you you have to move the EPID further away, or um, for instance, the Electa system where you can't move it any closer, um, you can only capture so much of the field um, on your portal imager. Um, so if you have a really long field or, or something like that, um, you might not be able to capture it all. Um, there's also, of course, a collision potential. If you've got any couch kicks or you have, have a larger patient, you, you can't get that EPID in sometimes where it needs to be in order to capture a transit image. Um, so it, there are some weaknesses, of course, with using the, that portal imager. Yeah, I mean, that does look like a long list of weaknesses, but as you noted here in the slide, I mean, the good majority of these um, can be accounted for within your software solution that would accompany your use of your EPID as a dosimeter. So that's, uh, you know, would be a part of your commissioning process to characterize uh, some of that and a, and a part of the modeling process as well. So so that's, that's good to know that 
that's those weaknesses can really be handled for the most part. Yeah, um, you, you can't overcome the uh, the size of the imager limitation with software, but but definitely energy dependence can be uh, modeled and field size and backscatter. Um, there's a reason we do the flood field image for characterization, right? To to make sure that everything um, gives you the response that that you're expecting in order to be able to use it, particularly for dosimetry. Um, so TG307 uses some terminology. I guess I've used it some already in these slides here um, between uh, transit dosimetry and in vivo dosimetry and this sort of thing. I think it's very important for us to make sure that we're on the same page with this terminology. Um, I have to admit, personally, I, I, I have a hard time sitting in a room listening to a discussion when I know one person is using a term one way and the other person is using it a different way and, and they're not communicating to each other because the the terminology doesn't match um so if we could start i think well start i we're, we're well into this um if we could make sure that we're we're uh we have this terminology um i think that would be a good place for us to to go next yeah and you know the tg report this the schematic on the right was pulled from the task group report and uh, I thought it was really helpful like you said just to kind of get a frame of reference of their terminology and the picture is always worth a thousand words so we'll just kind of I'll go high level of um, explaining you know how this is laid out so of course epids can be used for both non-transit dosimetry and transit dosimetry setups so the picture explains a little bit about what that is the schematic on the right Non non transit is your is really your pre treatment. There's nothing in the beam, right? Exactly. And then transit transit is you have a phantom, you have a patient, you have something that your beam is going through before you're you're taking that image. Yeah. Um, so transit dosimetry, like you said, it it involves dose measurement as the beam after the beam passes through a patient or your phantom. But then there's you know the in vivo dosimetry part, and really that has three requirements. So first, it's acquired while the patient is being treated, so it's not a pre-treatment process. Um, two, it contains information about the position of the patient with respect to the treatment dose, so that's valuable information from risk management, you know, setup information. Um, and then three, it includes information about the absorbed dose in the patient. So ultimately, that's the goal of in vivo QA is to um, quantify dose in the patient or either dose at the epid. So it depends on whether you're doing dose to water or dose to epid. And in the next slide, we'll kind of explain a little bit about those differences. But um, you could you could back project into a plane of the patient and dose to water. You could make comparisons at the epid panel. So it's, it differs for different vendors or different purposes. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to talk about forward projection and backward projection as well, because this um, of the solutions that are out there, there's a wide variety of ways that the companies have um, have approached analysis of the EPID image. Um, and so a forward projection um, sort of, of method is a little bit less complex because you're, you're just um, looking at the beam passing through the patient um, when we're talking transit dosimetry specifically. Um, you don't necessarily have to know where the patient is um, on that particular day, if you are um, doing a forward projection, um, you can you can look at where the patient should be um, to create a, a predicted exit um, image, whether that's at the imager or or calculated at a specific depth in water um, that's a specific plane, um, and then compare what you measure with what you've uh, what you predicted. Um, it doesn't actually give you dose distributions within the patient if you're not doing any back projection, um, but it it, it um, has a little bit lower uncertainty in the comparison of your predicted versus your measured because it's, it doesn't have some of those assumptions about where the patient is today. You're just comparing what you measured with where the patient should have been and then attenuation differences or scatter differences, things like that, um, or, or those differences because you didn't deliver the field properly, those show up in that in that exit um, that comparison. Back projection is about getting that taking that measured image and then trying to get the dose back up into the the, the patient anatomy. Um, so this is a method to be able to provide dose distributions within the patient geometry, um, but you may have larger uncertainties in the dose calculation because in in um, taking the the image off your epid, 
you have to make some assumptions about where the patient was, how much scatter was generated, what materials were in the way of the beam in order to calculate that back into the patient geometry. So it could be uh, just an assumption that the, the patient geometry is the same as what was, what was planned and you're calculating the dose back into the planning CT, um, but that misses a little bit of, or potentially misses a little bit of if the patient was in a different place, that may not be where the dose went or, or that may not be what the scatter conditions were. Um, Vicki, I know some of the of the systems out there do use log files in order to, to calculate the dose in the patient. Um, so yeah. Do you wanna explain a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, basically what that is, it's, it's a more of a forward projection approach. So they would forward project um, based on the machine performance information during treatment from the log files. And they would forward project that either onto the planning CT or they could use a CBCT um, and potentially in combination with some position, collimator positions or MLC positions from EBIT imaging, depends on the, the vendor. But yeah, that, that's more of a forward projection approach. And the log files don't actually com contain any patient information. No, um, so that, that has performance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and they'll see so positions, where... collimator, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that, you are missing in, out on some some positioning information. It's kind of looking at the ideal scenario, as you said. Yeah, the the in vivo portion of the measurement um, has to come from something that's actually after the patient. Yes, uh, exactly. All right. So as once you have your calculation, um, depending on your system, there are different types of comparisons that can be done with the data. Um, some systems do simply a relative comparison, um, and that would be the, the comparison of today's measurements with measurements on, say, your first day of treatment or, or a reference day. Um, these are really good for catching changes in the delivery or changes in the attenuation from this patient um, as they go through treatment, um, whether that's due to setup or due to um, um, motion or due to uh, patient weight loss or tumor shrinkage, that sort of thing. Um, it's not as good at catching systematic errors because if you were wrong with your dose calibration or you were wrong with your data transfer was wrong and the the, um, the plan was corrupted, some, some MLC field shape is not properly imported. Um, if you've done it wrong the first day and you're just comparing with the first day, you won't catch those systematic errors. Um, so the, the, the next step really is either that comparison of dose in water or dose in patient um, compared to a plane or, or a 3D map that's been exported from your treatment planning system, um, or you're looking at a comparison of measured dose or, or fluence, um, some fluence in calibrated units for the, it's the variant system, um, which is close to dose, but not exactly, right? Um, at the portal imager and compare that with what what is predicted at the imager and this is this is what our adaptivo software does um, and that can help you look at not only am I doing this consistently are things changing from day to day um, but was it delivered properly the first time um, and and we're comparing with what what should have happened if the, the plan were properly delivered and the patients in the proper position um, so there's um, had a note here I wanted to make sure I talked about um, the the types of errors that you can catch with um, with these these two methods are slightly more comprehensive than uh, than with the relative comparison it, it really is looking at plan transfer accuracy um, plan delivery accuracy um, and then changes in the patient anatomy whether that's you know weight loss, um, for head and neck patient um, or or changes in patient setup. Definitely. But, you know, of course, with every new program, there's new QA burdens. Um, so, Indeed. you know, there is quality assurance that needs to happen upstream on your EPID system. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So TJ307, um, really strongly recommends in terms of commissioning your EPID dosimetry system, make sure you've commissioned your LINAC and your EPID for general imaging use first. 
make sure it's working well that way, you're comfortable using it that way, you're getting the, the results and the, and the behavior from the system that you expect um, in terms of uh, consistent imaging um, alignment of your ISO center from imaging to treatment. Um, the important things that, that we normally would check for um, imaging use of the portal imager. And then the second part of commissioning a new dosimetry system for your EPID is understand your vendor requirements for that dosimetry software. Based on the algorithm that's being used by the software and the requirements that are needed if you're trying to do beam matching for your machine or if you're just implementing a, a more of a, a generic beam model for your type of Linux, um, there will be different requirements for what you need to do in order to commission your system. So do your due diligence beforehand, determine or understand what's required, make sure you've got prerequisites in place before you step into the commissioning process. Um, and that will make it a lot more smooth for you as well as um, um, accurate. <laughs> and what am I trying to say? Makes it um, a lot easier implementation of this dosimetry software in order to integrate it into your workflow. Once it's commissioned, make sure you go through some validation plans as well. Um, and the task group talks about um, creating phantom plans of various anatomical sites in order to really evaluate your system. And once you're comfortable with those accurately delivered plans, um, it takes time and it takes effort, but make a test plan that has a known error um, and or a couple test plans with known errors in order to eval to test how well your system picks that up. Um, there are variations in, in sensitivity for different sorts of errors, um, and it's good to understand both the strengths and the limitations of your um, new dosimetry system um, so that you know what to expect and what to follow up with when an error does show up on a patient treatment. Yeah, and then definitely it's important ahead. to understand like potentially clinically, what are your site specific, specific tolerance for, for your system to help start, you know, setting the stage for, for that. So that's, that's definitely something that's good. You don't want to set your system up so tightly that, you know, you're getting alerted for things that, you know, are, are within not, you know, you're looking too finely at, at your tolerances. So you really need to understand that. And I think we talk about that uh, in the next slide, perhaps. Yeah, I think so. Um, before we switch to that one, actually, I have two thoughts here. One is um, just a comment of being aware that this, if you're if you're commissioning for pretreatment QA, your standard pretreatment QA type tolerances are going to be good um, to be able to use that, just as you would um, with some of the the other pretreatment QA measurement systems. If you're commissioning it for transit dosimetry, you're adding another another um, variable into the treatment delivery, and that is the patient setup and the patient anatomy. And so you're not necessarily going to be able to hold yourself to those exact same tolerances um, that you would in pretreatment QA, just because there's a little more uncertainty in the measurement and the setup, um, and, and it needs to be considered if you don't want to be flagged for every other treatment um, when it's, it's a minor issue and not a major issue that needs attention. Um, so that's where creating those test plans um, and establishing kind of a baseline for what you expect for your system is so critical. Um, and then, of course, ongoing QA, if you pick one or two of those validation plans, you can perform those plans periodically um, in order to ensure that that with a software upgrade or or something else that, that might be changing, um, your system is still working properly. So this, yes, this slide was the one that, that talks about um, the, there's a difference not only in the, the pretreatment to transit dosimetry sort of tolerances and the way that, that you might approach um, setting those site specific setting those tolerances, um, but they may have to be site specific because the, the um, a portal imaging system relies on attenuation differences through the patient. Um, and so that'll be more sensitive for treatment sites like head and neck, where the patient loses some weight, there's a, a fairly major difference in the, the attenuation or, or a large tumor is shrinking. Um, they won't be as sensitive for something like an abdominal treatment where the patient is, is shifted superiorly, inferiorly by, by a centimeter. Um, it's not a good thing to have that happen, but the, the attenuation through the patient isn't going to change 
very much. And so your portal imager isn't going to be as good at picking up that sort of error um, in for that sort of site uh, treatment. Yeah, definitely, definitely helpful to have realistic expectations. So again, you're getting the most value out of uh, this. So it definitely site specific expectations are important. And, and that will be an evolution of as it's being introduced into your clinic, that should be a part of your QA program is evaluating that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and we've mentioned pretreatment a few times here, but but not really dwelled on it. Um, but the the task group has a wonderful um, literature review of a whole bunch of different um, different investigations of um, transit dosimetry and the sorts of errors that that different systems have detected. Um, that's that is a wonderful read through. If you, since we don't have time to read all thirty papers, um, to read through that portion of TG three hundred seven to to have a little bit better feel for the sorts of errors that can be detected. Um, but they also comment that uh, in that literature review that for pretreatment QA the EPID systems have demonstrated similar or better results compared with your other detector array systems um, that, that are frequently used for VMAP and IMRT pretreatment QA. So with that, I guess um, we're nearly at the end of our half an hour. Um, I don't like to take up huge amounts of your time. I know this TG307 is a, a very large work. Um, we have we've given the umbrella overview of it, um, and I'll, I'll go through these these final recommendations that it has. Um, but I do strongly recommend that you read through it to get the details. Um, but overall, the, the recommendations are, um, number one, recognize your system strengths and weaknesses. So that's both the strengths and weaknesses of your physical EPID, the size it can handle, the field sizes it can handle, the energy dependencies that, that might need to be accounted for, um, and, and algorithmic, what are the, the um, weaknesses of the calculation method that's being used, whether that's for correcting the energy dependence or whether that's a forward projected versus backward projected difference um, of, of what you can expect to see and, and how that will help you tease out where these errors are coming from. Um, and that, that helps you know what action to take then when, when an error occurs. Um, Recommendation number two is, as I mentioned previously, make sure you commission your Linac and your imager for general imaging use before you step into commissioning an epidosimetry system. Um, consider treatment site when you're setting tolerances um, or when you're analyzing results. Um, and then, of course, uh, in good physics practice, establish both your validation tests and your routine QA so that those are in place um, and easy to, to return to or refer to. Um, as you need to throughout the, the clinical use of this product. Yeah, and of course, the goal is to have, you know, use the tools that you already have that can be easily integrated into your workflow and and uh, add value to your patient-specific quality assurance program. Well, thank you for, Shannon. It's It's been wonderful to have this review from somebody who participated in the task group. Um, it was a lot of information. It's 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 a great um, report, very comprehensive, easy to read, good summaries, uh, great overview. So thank you. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was an excellent group to work with. Everybody was was very dedicated to doing this well and making it understandable and usable um, to the the AAPM as a whole. Um, so I think it's a wonderful resource, especially if you are just now thinking about maybe I should start considering a product to, to use so that I can make use of my portal imager. Um, but even if you are using one now, if you've been using it for, for five years, um, read through, read the, I mean, just the, the summary of the, the literature review alone is worth um, worth reading through just to remind yourself of, of what, um, what else you might be able to glean from that information. Yeah, and if you're interested in standard imaging solution, I'm giving a webinar uh, two weeks from now, April 11th, on our newest version of Adaptivo. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions there and uh, share information about our product. And so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will check over the Q&A right now. Um, sorry, I definitely did not look at that. <laughs>
Uh, During, the first oh, question, a... uh, can you see? Go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll say the question. Um, can you please comment on the dose rate effect, i.e. 6MV versus 6FFF? Some older panels cannot handle 6FFF dose rates. Um, you can interject too, Shannon, but yes, that is correct. Some older panels do have a harder time and are not, um, can't do integrated imaging with a 6FFF. Um, so that, that is an issue, but most modern panels uh, can handle that just fine. There are some issues with saturation that for the commissioning process, but um, positioning the panel appropriately for some of those measurements uh, assists with that. Do you have anything else to add, Shannon? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah. 